Welcome to Lecture 5. In last lecture, we started to examine the topic of dimensional analysis. We saw ways in which we could derive non-dimensional groups. We could derive them using physical intuition, or from first principles, or from examining equations such as Bernoulli's equation and dividing one of the additive terms by one of the other additive terms. And we also took property ratios we saw that actually it's far better to start to develop some physical intuition, to use page 35 of your data book to learn what each of these non-dimensional groups actually physically mean, and then to look at a problem and say, well, I can see in this problem that I have inertial stress and viscous stress at play, so therefore there's a Reynolds number. Or, for example, I see that there is the interchange between potential energy and kinetic energy, so there's probably a Froude number associated with this. When we looked at the first principles derivation, we saw that we could get to an answer, and that we will always be able to get to an answer, but it's quite long-winded and quite arduous, therefore prone to mistakes. So use that as a method of last resort. Throughout our discussion and our examples of dimensional analysis so far, we haven't actually stated any rules for how many non-dimensional groups we have to find. We can find groups now, but the question is, how many are we actually looking for? So, in this lecture, we're going to have a look at finding non-dimensional groups again, and finding how many independent non-dimensional groups govern a problem. We will have a look then at how to use experiments hand in hand with dimensional analysis to start to get some relationships that we can use to describe physical processes. So I'm going to introduce to you now a concept that you probably will have seen before. Here on the board I've put the statement of Buckingham's Pi theorem. Buckingham said, for a problem with n parameters involving m fundamental dimensions, then the number of independent dimensionless groups you need to find is n minus m. So, a nice simple rule. Let's put it into practice. So here on the whiteboard now, I've got that cartoon of the problem that we were solving last time, rigorously. Let's apply Buckingham's Pi theorem to this. We have, in terms of parameters, density and viscosity of the fluid, rho and u, that's 2. We've got the force on the sphere, that's 3. We've got the sphere diameter, 4, and the sphere velocity, 5. So there's five parameters involved with this problem. If we think which fundamental dimensions are associated with these parameters, we'll see that there is mass, length, and time. So there's three fundamental dimensions. Therefore, we are seeking two groups to fully describe this problem. So now we know how many groups we have to search for. So, let's have a quick look. We can see that we've got a fluid dynamics problem. We can see that we've got viscosity and density present, which in turn means that we probably have inertial stress and viscous stress. So, we've got all the other parameters needed there. We've got a length scale, we've got a velocity to form a Reynolds number. So, my first non-dimensional group, which I'm going to call pi 1, capital pi 1, is our Reynolds number. Now, our second non-dimensional group, using some intuition this time, is going to be as a result of the interplay between the force we're pulling the sphere with and the resistive force that is retarding its motion, i.e. the drag. And so we have a non-dimensional group for that. It's the drag coefficient, CD. It's tabulated on page 35 of your data book, which is F over rho d squared v squared. And I'm going to call that group capital Pi 2. So, we've fully described our problem in terms of dimensionless groups. We've got pi 1, which is our Reynolds number, we've got pi 2, which is our drag coefficient. So, this is a useful thing. Now, I'm going to return to an earlier example. Let's return to mini example 3. If you recall, mini example 3 was one of our pipe flow examples. This was, if you like, the pinnacle of our pipe flow examples because we were trying to find the pressure drop that developed along a certain length of pipe. And so we always started with a diagram, and here on the whiteboard is that diagram for mini examples three. We have our pipe length of diameter d, a fluid inside it having a density rho and viscosity mu. The pipe also has a length l. The fluid is pushed along the pipe with pressure p, and consequently the fluid flows with a velocity u. Okay, so firstly, 
Let's apply Buckingham's Pi theorem. There are six parameters in this problem, governed by the same three fundamental dimensions that we had for the previous problem, mass, length and time. So we seek three groups to fully describe this problem. Let's find these groups. We can see it's a fluid dynamics problem. We can see that we have the interplay between inertial stress and viscous stress, so Reynolds number is going to be important. Let's put Reynolds number as my first non-dimensional group, pi 1. Let's seek another dimensionless group. We need to find two more. And we can see that we've got a ratio of length scales, L over D. So let's put that as my second non-dimensional group, pi 2. I need one more. I need one more that involves pressure. And if you recall what we did in mini example 3, we used Bernoulli's equation. We saw that we had P, we had a rho V squared, and we divided the two together. So here we are, my third non-dimensional group, pi 3, is P over rho U squared. Those are the three groups I need to describe this problem. Fine. We've, we've got to this before, and now we know, using Buckingham's pi theorem, that we don't need to look for any other groups. Now, let's do something with this problem now. There's my problem with the three groups on it, and I know from theory that pi 3, the group involving pressure, because I want to find the pressure, is going to be a, an additive series that looks like that that I've put on the board. We've got, in each term of the series, a grouping of the other two dimensionless groups, pi 1 and pi 2, each raised to their own respective power, and then a numerical constant, c. So I have c1, pi 2 to the alpha 1, pi 1 to the beta 1, plus c2, pi 2 to the alpha 2, pi 1 to the beta 2, and so on and so forth. And remember, Everything that is additive has to have the same dimensions. The same dimensions also have to apply across an equal sign. On the left-hand side, I have pi 3, which is dimensionless by definition. So therefore, each of these additive groups are also dimensionless. So this problem obeys homogeneity and consistency. The key now is to think, well, how many of these additive groups on the right-hand side do I actually need to use? What are the values of alpha and beta? And what is the value of C? So, we're going to plan some experiments. And we can use dimensional analysis to gain insight into the types of experiment that we need to do. So, what we want to do is to build a model where the physics is the same and the geometry is the same. Or at least representative in the model scale of what we've got at the large scale. So, what we do is keep each of these dimensionless groups the same. So I'm going to find pi 3 as a function of pi 1, keeping pi 2 constant. Keeping pi 2 constant gives us something that we term geometric similarity. If we remind ourselves that pi 2 is length divided by diameter, L over D, it's effectively the aspect ratio of the pipe that we're looking at. So geometric similarity in this case means keeping the aspect ratio of the pipe the same. Let's think of the other experiment we need to do. Again, we're looking to find a group containing pressure, so we're looking for pi 3, now as a function of pi 2 at constant pi 1. And if we remember what pi 1 was, this was our Reynolds number. This described how turbulent or how laminar our flow was. So this is governing the physics in the fluid. And so by keeping pi 1 the constant at different scales, we are keeping the same fluid physics. And this is something that we term dynamic similarity. So, we need to do some experiments. The experiments we're going to do involve geometric similarity, keeping the aspect ratio the same, and looking at how pressure varies with the Reynolds number. And then, by keeping the Reynolds number constant, and looking at how pressure varies with aspect ratio. So those are our two experiments that we need to do. So, what I'm going to do now is present some data. Imagine that the data on the whiteboard now have come from careful, careful experimentation. So careful and so rigorous, in fact, that all the points fall on a perfectly straight line, with our coefficient of determination, r squared, being equal to 1. OK, at this point you might get a little bit suspicious and say, well, you've rigged that to get such a good r squared, and yes, all right, I have got the results from theory here, but the main aim here is to prove a point. So, we have some data. We've fitted an expression to that data. The dotted line is my data fit. 
The individual points are the experimental points. We can see on the board that I have fixed pi 2, which is my aspect ratio, to be 20. And I've given you the values of viscosity and density as well. So, by keeping our aspect ratio fixed, I've investigated pi 3, the group involving pressure, with pi 1, Reynolds number. And by doing a data fit to this, I can see that pretty well, pi 3 is about 643 divided by pi 1. That's a full description of that data set. OK, let's put this to one side and let's have a look at our second set of experiments. So this is my second set of experiments where I'm now looking at pi 3 as a function of aspect ratio, L upon D, keeping Reynolds number constant. Reynolds number is my dynamic similarity bit, and I can see, looking at the value of Reynolds number, pi 1 equals 10, that I am firmly in the laminar flow regime. Remember, laminar to turbulent transition happens at a Reynolds number of about 1,500 to 2,000, depending on physical conditions. So, for laminar fluid flow, I can see that pi 3 is kind of proportional to pi 2, isn't it? So, let's have a look at the relationship that we get. Again, the individual points are my experimental data points, and my dash line there is a fit to those experimental data points. And I can see that pi 3 is about 3.2 times pi 2. Perfect. OK, so I've allowed dimensional analysis to uncover which groups govern a problem. I've allowed dimensional analysis to inform what experiments I have to do. I've performed some experiments. I've obtained some regressions from those experiments. Let's tie it all together. So, key results from my experiments I've put on the board. I've got my relationship between pi 3 and pi 1, and my relationship between pi 3 and pi 2. Let's remind ourselves of the key result from dimensional analysis. And we had pi 3 with this summation of terms, each term including pi 2, pi 1, and a numerical constant, c. Now, what we want to do is to figure out what the relationship is, what the value or values of C are, and what the value or values of alpha and beta are. Now, hopefully we can see, because we've been able to perfectly describe each of our single experiments with just a simple relationship between either pi 3 and pi 2, or pi 3 and pi 1, we don't actually need any higher order terms. We're looking at a single regime of behaviour. If our curves from experiment had had different regimes, it might have been one gradient for a certain range of values and a different gradient for a second range of values, then we would have needed more additive terms in order to capture that behaviour. But because both gradients in the experimental data sets were constant, I only need that one set of terms. And in that set of terms, I'm going to say that the exponent of pi 2 where pi 3 is, 3.2 times pi 2 is 1, so alpha 1 equals 1. And my exponent of pi 1, beta 1, is going to be minus 1, because there's that inverse relationship between pi 3 and pi 1. Right, OK, so now what we're going to do is compare. I'm setting alpha 1 to 1, beta 1 to minus 1, ignoring any terms involving c2, c3 and above, and just concentrating on pi 3 equals c1 times pi 2, 1 over pi 1. So, here we have, in red on the whiteboard, pi 3 is 643.1, pi 1 to the minus 1. That was my experimental result, which has to be equivalent to c1 times pi 2 to the alpha 1, so 20 to the power of 1, times pi 1 to the power of minus 1. And if I work through, I can find that C1 is around 32, 32.2. Let's have a look at that second result. So I'm going to check. This is between pi 3 and pi 2 now. So pi 3 was about 3.2 pi 2, which should be equivalent to C1 times pi 2 times 10 to the minus 1. That's my 1 over Reynolds number term, 1 over 10. And again, my calculation shows that C1 is about 32. 32.1. So we have consistency for our numerical constant across both of these results, which is a bit of a relief and reassures us that our analysis is hopefully correct. Now, 
Let's put all this together. Our final result looks a little bit like this. Pi 3 on the left hand side was p over rho u squared and the relationship that we determined in terms of aspect ratio L upon d and inverse Reynolds number was there was a numerical constant of 32. So p over rho u squared is roughly 32 L upon d times 1 over Reynolds number. Let's compare this with some theory. Fluid mechanics theory that you will have seen says that pressure is going to be 4 times 16 over Reynolds number, that is my friction factor for a laminar flow, times L over D times a half rho u squared. This is for laminar flow only, of course. And we can see that 4 times 16 over 2 gives us 32. And both of the groups, L upon D and 1 upon Reynolds number, are present. So there we have, tied up together, our dimensional analysis and our experiments producing a useful result that we can then go and use to design stuff with. Remember, however, the limitations of the experiments you've done, in this case, laminar flow only. Let's recap a few key points. We had a look at Buckingham's Pi theorem. This gives us the number of independent dimensionless groups that are applicable for any given problem. That number of groups is n minus m, parameters minus fundamental dimensions. We had a look at geometric similarity. In this case, we kept a ratio of length scales the same. We had a look at dynamic similarity, which is keeping the key physics the same. In this case, my Reynolds number. And we saw how dimensional analysis and experimentation go hand in hand to allow us to work out the relationship of physical processes.